stream internet connection. We're recording this. We're recording this and we'll upload the, the teaching tonight after the show because this network, this, this internet here in Mississippi is coming in and out. So bear with us, but don't worry about it. You not miss anything where we cut you off. We stopped teaching for a minute. We were talking about the, uh, the feast being spring and fall. The spring feast being the Lord's first coming. The fall feast being the Lord's second coming. And, and it's all being recorded and we'll upload this if you lose us tonight, fret not, uh, and so forth. But what I was showing our group here, and let me get it right here. This right here, Passover, is really the, the beginning of Israel's spiritual year. And it ends the spring feast and the Pentecost. Now, if you've got your sheet there, what these feasts represent is really what's important. Uh, it is the Lord's Passover. And um, hopefully we still got connection. And if we don't, it's fine. Is it back up? Good. Now, we may lose y'all again, so just bear with us. It's recording, so you're not going to miss nothing. On y'all's sheet right here, I want you to look at this with me. Passover begins on Nisan the 14th. Nisan basically has most of the spring feasts that take place. Tishri is the first month of the year on the Jewish calendar. Um, Passover... The historical significance is when, again, Israel came out of Egyptian bondage. The lamb was slain, the blood was applied. The significance of that is that is representing Christ's crucifixion. Okay? You follow that with me tonight? The unleavened bread feast, which takes place one day after Passover, is when Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt the day after the blood was applied on the doorpost. Now, I'm going to teach the Passover more in South Dakota, but I will make a little Bible nugget note about this tonight. It's very ironic that both the spring feast of Pentecost and the fall feast of trumpets have something very much in common. Both feasts have to do with Israel moving and journeying and leaving. The Passover, she was leaving Egypt. The trumpet celebration was Israel leaving her camp to go war against her enemies. It is so beautifully done in a way that what it's really referring to is that when the church is taken off this earth, just as Moses told Israel in Egypt to have your feet shod, to be at ready at any second to leave and you're going to we're going to get out of Egypt at any second now the same thing is going to be true about trumpets and we're going to study trumpets more tonight than we are Passover we come to see us in South Dakota because we're going to deal with Passover and the rapture because there's a lot of similarities in Passover too but technically it speaks of the death of Christ on the cross and that shed blood of the lamb uh, our redemption, folks, I'm going to say this tonight. I don't mean this to be um, snarky at all, but I, I feel led to say this every chance I can get. Folks, deliverance, sanctification, justification, forgiveness of sins, deliverance, spiritual warfare, uh, uh, freedom from demons, freedom from spirits, freedom from bondage, freedom from the lust of the flesh, freedom from the lust of the eyes, freedom from the pride of life, Freedom from anger, freedom from sex addiction, freedom from lust, freedom from cigarette smoking, freedom from jealousy, freedom from bitterness, unforgiveness, hatred, variance, emulation, strife, forgiveness, all of these things. All deliverance tonight does not come from worshiping these feasts. It comes from the blood of the Lamb. It comes from Jesus, Andrew. Come on now. It comes from the blood. Egypt was Israel's home. Let me tell you something. God spent nine months, think about this, God spent nine months of miracles trying to get Pharaoh to let Israel go. Can I ask you all in here tonight, did any of those miracles that God performed cause Pharaoh's heart to let her go? No. 
Not one, right? Not one miracle that God did, whether it was the plagues of the lice, the plague of darkness, the plague of hail, the, uh, the, the killing of the cattle, the light being in Israel's camp and the darkness being in Egypt's camp. Uh, none of that. It didn't even phase Pharaoh. It made him harder. It hardened his heart. He got more angry about it. But the night that he went to Moses and he said, you take a lamb, you slit the lamb's blood, neck, you put the blood on the doorpost. I'm coming through Egypt tonight. And he said, Moses, I can guarantee you this. He said, I've hardened Pharaoh's heart for a reason. He said, I am about to reveal to Egypt and I'm about to reveal to Israel too that I'm God. And he said, I'm about to move in Egypt in a way that after this night, after this night of Passover, he will let you go. And what did God do that night in Egypt? The blood was put on that doorpost and the death angel came through. He told Moses, he said, every firstborn is going to die in Egypt. That's not behind the door with the blood on it. I'm going to tell you this tonight, folks. If there would have been a Hebrew, if there would have been a Hebrew that did not obey Moses' command and put the blood on their doorpost and they wandered off and they said, well, that don't apply to us. That just applies to those old evil Egyptians. They would have perished. If there would have been an Egyptian that heard Moses and heard they were putting the blood on the doorpost and they obeyed Moses' command, and there evidently were some because the Bible tells us in Exodus when they were coming out of Israel, they came out as a mixed company. There were Egyptians mixed in with the Israelites. So there were some Egyptians that heard the warning, and guess what they did? They got behind the door with the blood on it, didn't they? There's a Bible lesson in that tonight. It don't matter whether you're an Israelite, an Egyptian, an American, a Jew, Gentile, black, white, red, yellow, pink, green, a mixture of all of the above. Neighbor, it's about the blood. Can I get an amen in the house tonight? It's about the blood. It's always been about the blood. It will always be about the blood. Cain and Abel were both wicked. We talked about that yesterday morning on the Bible study, and I'm getting the Holy Ghost jolly juice just even thinking about it right now. It wasn't the fact that Abel was more righteous than his brother morally. He was just as sinful as Cain was. But you know what Abel had in his heart? He had something called faith in the Lamb. He took that lamb to God. He said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I can't redeem myself. I can't forgive myself. I can't cleanse myself. I'm bringing this animal to you because I saw you slay that animal in the Garden of Eden with my mom and daddy when they sinned against you, and I recognized that that's the way to you. And when Abel did that, that's what made him righteous. And what made Israel redeemed out of Egypt was not the miracles tonight. It was not the miracles tonight. It was the blood. Amen. Amen. And that's what Passover represents. Cain brought the work of his hand. So that's, this Passover speaks of the crucifixion. And all deliverance comes as a result of the cross tonight. The second spring feast is unleavened bread. This speaks of the burial of Christ. It speaks of His perfect, sinless life and His humanity as the Son of God. Whereas Passover speaks of our redemption, unleavened bread, if you look up here on the screen tonight, speaks of our sanctification. It speaks of our walk with God because this feast lasted for seven days. It took Israel seven days, basically, to get out of Egypt. Can I tell you some little, little Bible nugget tonight? Why the church thinks that when people get saved that they're instantaneous saints, I have no idea. Because uh, it took God a long time. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me word it like this. It took God one night. <laughs> this is good. It took God one night to get... Israel out of Egypt. It took him nearly 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Do you follow that tonight? I'm going to say that again. I want to say that again to you folks out there listening to me tonight that think you're sainted calves and think your, your spiritual turd don't stink. Let me tell you something, folks. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. We still got Egypt in all of us. As long as we've got this sin nature in us, we have got Egypt in all of us tonight. 
And there ain't no formulas and no schemes and no blowing on people, screaming at people, shaking people, going to deliverance parties and going to deliverance conferences and getting in prayer lines and prayer shawls and all this other nonsense and worshiping God on the Sabbath and worshiping God at the feast and, and doing all this crazy faith nonsense. And I'm trying to not preach tonight. But I get excited when I talk about the cross and the blood of Jesus because let me tell you something, the very fact that we are sanctified by faith tonight and we're redeemed by faith that goes back to this prophetic feast of unleavened bread. It was his sinless life. He is the only sinless one out there. He's always been the only sinless one out there. He will always be the only sinless one out there. And if we will put our faith in him tonight, he will make us perfect before God. In the sight of God. Amen. That sin nature in us does not go away until we are glorified. Amen. And it will not go away in any of you out there tonight either. It will not go away with me. We are to crucify the flesh. And see that unleavened bread, that, that feast of unleavened bread, they were to take bread. I want you to notice this. The Passover was to be eaten with unleavened bread. The unleavened bread week was to be celebrated. If there was found any leaven in the house, that individual was to die. Folks, Christ, He is our Passover. It's not about the feast any longer. It's about Him. Amen. Because it, let, me, let me move on because I'm going to show you a little contrast here in a minute about these spring feasts. Remember that statement I just said about Passover and unleavened bread. Those feasts represent Christ. But our significance is it, it speaks of us being free from the leaven of sin that corrupts. Let me tell you this tonight, folks. You can't confess your way out of sin. And what I mean by that, you can't go to a priest, you can't go to anybody else, they cannot get sin out of you through any human means. It is only through the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the resurrected Lamb and the power of Almighty God and the power of the blood of Jesus tonight. That is how we're set free from sin. That's why His humanity is so important because a sinful man, listen to us tonight, listen to this carefully, Sinful man can never approach a thrice holy God. Amen. Yes, a, God is a spirit. He's not human. He is a man, but he's a spirit. That's what John 4 says. God is a spirit. They that worship God must worship in how? Spirit and in truth. Right? It was Christ, though, that came as the gap between sinful humanity and God the Father. Listen to me tonight. If Christ would have had any, any, any sin in Him, any smidgen of sin in Him, His sacrifice would have been worthless. Understand tonight? If, if, if He would have had any sin, which He did not, if there had been any imperfection in Him, anything that... I, I feel this song is so strong tonight. How beautiful his sinless humanity is. That's what this Feast of Unleavened Bread represents. It's, it's, it's really our salvation is how we're redeemed, we're justified at, at the cross. And then the Holy Spirit takes us. He takes the sinful man and he makes us like Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit because Christ is our figure that we move to and the only way we attain to that is through repentance and through conviction and faith. Amen. Amen. It's not by works. Paul said that in Ephesians. He said, it is not of works lest any man should boast. We're not standing righteous before God tonight because of works. Let me tell you this. Again, I want to go back to say what I said about Israel. Israel used these feasts. They worshipped these feasts. They made these feasts the object of their worship and they stopped worshiping the Christ that they represented. Do you realize tonight, folks, that in a few weeks, in a month, there's going to be millions of Jewish people in this world. There's going to be millions of people that are going to honor the Passover. There's millions of people tonight honoring Purim. They, they don't even understand the God of Esther. If you read the book of Esther, we're going to get to Esther. We're going to talk about Esther a lot tomorrow. I'm talking of an overview of these feasts tonight. Oh, this is good stuff. 
Look, let, let me tell you this. All of these feasts, all of these feasts, even the two that's not mentioned in Leviticus, all of them, all of them, they all point to Christ. Amen. They all point to Him. They were all fulfilled in Him. You can worship on every Sabbath day, and I knew what I was going to say while I go about the Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me before I forget it. This is going to be my first ugly statement of the weekend. <clears throat> it may not be my last, but it will be my first one. If you don't think that some of these people that worship God on the Sabbath are mean as snakes, you don't even know human nature. Amen. I'll amen myself on that one tonight. I've seen just as many mean-spirited, unforgiving, bitter, hateful, resentful, crap, uh, just ugly, ugly, mean as snake people worshiping God on Saturday as I do them worshiping Him on Sunday. And I'm going to say something to you tonight, folks. If you don't know Christ, I don't care what day you're worshiping God on, you're not going to go to heaven. Amen? Amen. You're not going to heaven because you worship God on the Sabbath. God's not tied to a day. He is tied to His Son who the Sabbath day represents. Glory to God tonight. It's not about a day. It's about a person. He is the Sabbath. He is the Passover. He is the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it is because of His sinless sacrifice that the gap between man and God has been crossed. Amen. Amen. And when we stand before the Lord one day, it is not going to be because of our filthy righteousness. I had somebody tell me recently that, and I know what they were trying to say, but what they said was absolutely 1,000% false. And when they told me that, he said, well, you, we don't get to heaven because we're born again. We get to heaven because of our character. And we get to heaven because we're moral. Let me tell you something, folks. There's a lot of moral people burning in hell tonight. There's a lot of people with good character that are burning in hell tonight because they thought that. They thought, I'm good enough to get to heaven. They thought I'm good enough to please God. Like if I worship God on the Sabbath, if I worship God in these feasts, if I do this and I do that, if I take communion 16 times, have you heard that one? I've heard that one out there. Yeah. That if we take communion 20 times a day, if we'll take communion on the hour, that that's works. somehow going to work. That's going to ward off. That's going to ward off these demon spirits, man. This is going to ward off the devil. This is going to get your generational tree cleaned out. No, let me tell you something, folks. Those people that believe that, they're lost. Amen. I want to go ahead and say it tonight. If you're putting your faith in anything other than the cross of Christ tonight and His crucifixion and His burial and resurrection, you are putting your faith in another Jesus tonight. It's because of His sinless Amen. sacrifice that we stand before God justified Amen. and sanctified tonight. And before some moron goes out there and, well, he's just preaching the sin and salvation. No, I'm not. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's leaven in all of us, folks, and I'll get to the leaven in a minute because I want to talk about that leaven. That unleavened bread on these feasts are for a reason to show man something. It's just to show us something prophetically. I ain't even got to the good stuff yet. What's my time over there? We're good. It's yeah, just this crew tonight. We ain't going to worry about the clock. Andrew told me, he said, I don't care if you teach till midnight tonight. He said, I'm, I'm, I've traveled a long way to listen to this. And he said, I want to get my money's worth out of this. I said, I'm going to get my money's worth out of this conference tonight. But listen to me. That Feast of Unleavened Bread was a beautiful picture of the burial, of the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that also is a picture of? It's how we're buried with Christ. Amen. We are buried with Him in baptism. Oh, I love this. Oh, my goodness. In the mind of God, in the mind of God, in the mind of God, when He was crucified on the cross, He died, didn't He? He died for our sins. In the mind of God, when you put your faith in what Christ did for you at the cross, in the mind of God, you, you died with Him. And in the mind of God, when they put Christ in the tomb, guess who went into that tomb with Him spiritually? Me and you tonight. And the dead man and the old man is dead. And the new man in Christ is going to come forward in the Feast of First Fruits because that's that next feast. The day after the Sabbath, following Passover, guess what that represents? It represents the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God tonight. Amen. 
It was the first fruits of the harvest. And guess what it did? It celebrated the crossing of the Red Sea. Follow this with me tonight. God brought Egypt, Israel out of Egypt the night of Passover, didn't he? It took them probably seven days to get from Egypt to get everybody out. It was a million people, probably two million people that Moses had to deal with. Whew. Look, I love, I love these people that condemn Moses for doing what he did to get kicked out of the promised land. If I had to deal with two million grumbling, complaining, backslidden Israelites, I probably would have done the same. I probably would have done worse. My brother and I had a long talk last night about we're preacher's kids, and we, we spent, we saw our dad in 50 years in the church, and we, we understand how church folks can be. Can you imagine having a church of 2 million grumbling, complaining, backbiting, slandering, lying Israelite church members? That's what Moses had. And let me tell you how bad it got. They didn't even get to the Red Sea, and they were complaining about everything. We ain't even got to Sinai yet. Pentecost re represents Sinai. They were complaining to the Red Sea. They said, we would rather go back to Egypt and die. Didn't they? Yes. I mean, Moses yeah. was sitting there, and he, they had seen, think about this, folks. Think about this tonight. And, I, and I'd come to talk about a lot of other things. We got all weekend, so I, I don't care. We're, 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 this is exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to talk about tonight. Let me tell you this about the Red Sea experience. Israel has seen every miracle a nation has seen. Do you realize there was no miracles that had been seen by humanity up to that point except that generation of Moses and Joshua? Those two generations saw more miracles than any generation in the history other than the generation of Christ. You know, John wrote in his book that there were so many things done by Christ that if the, if the world... If there was a, uh, if there was was not enough books, there would not be enough volumes of books in the world to even record it. He said, "We just gave you a little sampling of the things that we saw." But he said, "If if everything that we saw him do were put into books, the world could not contain them." Israel, folks, you could almost say the same thing for Israel. Look, the Bible is one thousand percent truth. It's one thousand percent truth. But one thing. It's not exhaustive truth. And all that means is this. There are a lot of things that the Bible doesn't tell us. There's a lot of things that don't. Amen. And there's a lot of things that we have to wonder, like, it, it, you know, it's just like Christ growing up. The Bible is totally silent from the time he's a young boy in that temple to the time his ministry starts. The Bible is 1,000% silent. And the only thing you can depend on is historians that were there during that time that recorded events in his life. You, and that's all the Bible is, it doesn't mean. The Bible's silent about Adam and Eve and how long they were in the garden between the time they were created and the time they fell. They didn't tell how many miracles Israel saw in Egypt. God recorded nine of them in Exodus because he was trying to get Pharaoh's attention. By the way, nine is the number of birthing. Is that right, Sheila? Nine months, do you have a baby? Is that about right? That nine is the number of judgment. It's the time of birthing and travail. It's a number of birthing and travail. It took God nine months. Think about this. From the time that Moses first walked into Pharaoh and said, let my people go, nine months to the day Israel left Egypt, birthed as a nation, wow. went into Israel, into Egypt as a people. They came out of Egypt as a nation, birthed by God, birthed by blood. Nine months. They saw more miracles than we probably could shake a stick at. But think about this, folks. With all of those miracles, with all those miracles, they get out to the Red Sea. Do you think, and I, look, before we judge Israel, let me tell you something. It's the same thing with the modern church today, folks. Right. They didn't believe God enough to get them fully out of Egypt. Why would a people that had seen God do what he did to Pharaoh, Pharaoh was not some junior varsity leader. That was the largest empire on the earth of that day, the most powerful empire of that day. By the way, this was not some mighty army that took Pharaoh's kingdom down. It was a bunch of slaves. They were slaves in slave pits. They didn't have weapons. They didn't have nothing to fight with. This was not some 
war that took place when Israel took a bunch of machine guns and went into the halls of Pharaoh and said, let us out of here, let us go. Pharaoh had them under his jackbooted heel. And without God's help, they would have never come out of Egypt. You South Dakota folks, when y'all hear this now, you've got to say amen again because you're going to hear it again in South Dakota come April. I'm just warming you up. This is the warm-up in the bullpen. We ain't got to the good stuff yet tonight. Ain't this beautiful, though? Amen. Israel yes. could not have got out of Egypt without God. And let me tell you something. You and I can't get out of Egypt tonight without Him either. Amen. Man, I feel that on me tonight. My Lord, glory to God. Israel could not have got out of Egypt without the power of Almighty God, and we can't get out of our Egypt tonight without Christ and Him crucified either. Amen. What does Israel do? They stand at that Red Sea, and at the first sign of trouble, at the first sign of Pharaoh, at the first sign that they start hearing Pharaoh's chariots behind him. They start screaming to Moses, Oh my God, you've brought us out here, Moses, in the wilderness to die. They were screaming at Moses, complaining to Moses, grumbling at Moses, griping at Moses, striving at Moses, probably undermining Moses. I can almost see this. Look, again, I know church folks, and this was the church in the wilderness at the time. I can guarantee you there were people in Israel whispering little things. I guess... We should have never listened to Moses. We should have never listened to him. Moses is a false prophet. Moses is a false teacher. He's a false leader. We should have never come out here in this wilderness with him. Let's get our group and let's go on back to Egypt and let's go back to our little thing. Can you, do you understand? I believe that was going on out there because they were, they were just like a bunch of modern church folks today complaining, murmuring, bickering. We shouldn't have listened to Moses. Look what he did. He got us out here in this wilderness and they're going to kill us all. Unbelief. Unbelief. Of a generation that saw the power of Almighty God. Folks, let me ask you something tonight. I'm asking you folks. It's not just what he did in Egypt. He gets them out in the wilderness. What did he do? He saw the pillar of fire by night. He led them by night with that pillar of fire. Led them by a pillar of cloud by day. If I would have been Israel, look, Pharaoh saw it. Pharaoh gets out there in that wilderness and he's a heathen deity. He, his, his whole life was worshiping a false gods. He had seen this God of heaven destroy his firstborn, including his. You would have thought that would have gave Pharaoh a little heads up. This is something bigger than me. This is somebody bigger than me. He, he goes out and still tries to destroy Israel. But he sees this pillar of fire. I, I hate to say this tonight. Pharaoh had more respect for that pillar of fire than Israel did. Mm-hmm. Yes. He wouldn't dare try to have stopped Israel while that pillar of fire was protecting him. He had more faith in that than they did. Because they were murmuring and complaining and bickering and slandering Moses instead of believing God. And I've got a New Testament parallel of this because that's what these feasts are about tonight. These are the prophetic feast of prophecy. So what does Moses do? He said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And God told Moses that day, I never I love this passage in Egypt. He said, Moses, stand still. Don't speak a word. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. He said, I put that rod in your hand for a reason at that burning bush that day. He said, I've anointed that word. You know what that rod stands for? It stands for the word of God tonight. That rod was the almighty word of God. And God told Moses, he said, you stretch forth that rod over that ocean, but don't speak anything. Look forward. He said, stand still and see the salvation of God. Let me tell you what happened at the resurrection. Man, this is so deep tonight. Good Lord. Folks, do you realize that Satan had a list against man a million miles long before the cross? Have you ever wondered why Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, um, Moses, 
Every New Test Old Testament saint, Noah, Joshua, all the judges that were righteous, all the kings, there wasn't that many, but there were a few righteous kings. The prophets, when they died, there were very few righteous people. Job, um, when they died before the cross, they could not go to heaven. They went to paradise. That's why Christ told that thief that day on the cross, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say heaven, he said paradise for a reason. <clears throat> I ain't been too wired up to not have a... I'm just... Okay, thank you. You're my wired up checker, so I just want you to know. We're supposed to have been on the trumpets by now. We're just on first, first reach. We're in trouble. <clears throat> they're, they're, they're looking at this chart right here, and they're saying, we're never, ever getting to all of this tonight. But anyway. Um, but listen to me. It's very important, and we're going to move on from here, but this is very important about the resurrection. Before the crucifixion, Satan had a list against man a mile long. He had a legal right because of sin. Now follow me here tonight. He had a legal right tonight because of sin to keep man in bondage and to keep man in captivity, meaning that the, all those sacrifices of the Old Covenant, all of the blood of the animals could not atone for sin. They could cover the sin but they couldn't atone for it. But on the day of the crucifixion and the day that Christ died, Colossians 2, 13, 14, 15 tells us that he blotted out the ordinances that was against us. Those ordinances that was against us, folks, was the penalty of the law and the fact that a sinful creation could no longer stand before God outside of a mediator and a go-between. And when he came out of that grave and he came out of that tomb on the day of first fruits, it represents the resurrection. Every ordinance of Satan was rendered null and void. So Satan tonight, what does he do? He gets the church to try to believe in something other than the resurrection. He gets the church trying to put its faith in fables. He tries to get the church to put its faith in schemes. I'm going to be a little snarky tonight, not in a bad way, but I'm going to say it. He gets the church to believe in deliverance conferences. He gets the church to believe that if they worship Christ on the Sabbath, if we worship God on the Sabbath, that that's going to merit us all of this favor and all of this goodwill with God, and He is going to do everything for us. He is going to bless us beyond measure just because we're worshiping Him on a day. We have people that have wrote books and volumes of books, and there's numerous YouTube channels out there that claim if we worship God on the feast... We, I, if we keep to the feast calendar, that we celebrate the feast of the Lord. That's what Israel did. That there's special blessing in it. Do I not believe that these feasts are prophetic? Folks, we've named the teaching tonight the feast of prophecy. They're very prophetic. Because we ain't got to the prophetic part of these feasts yet, but we will in just a second because I've got to move on quickly. But these, these spring feasts need to be dealt with. Because if you don't understand the spring feast, you sure ain't going to understand the fall ones. But this first fruits was the resurrection. Folks, the power of the resurrection. When Paul said in Romans, he said, If the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead be in you, <laughs> you are, you've died with him, you have been buried with him. And guess what happened with us as children of God when he came out of that tomb in the mind of God? We came out of the tomb with him. Amen. We came out of the tomb with him. And not only did we come out of the tomb, we came out of that tomb as new creatures in Christ. Amen. Not new creatures of the Sabbath and not new creatures of the law, not new creatures of a denomination. We didn't come out as Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, uh, Assembly of God, Church of God. No, God doesn't see us like that. He sees us one of two ways. We're redeemed or we're not redeemed tonight. We are either saved or we're not saved tonight. We're either going to heaven tonight or we're going to hell tonight. 
We are either our name is in the Lamb's Book of Life or it's not in the Lamb's Book of Life. <clears throat> That's what the resurrection and the message of it, that because He lives, what do we do? We also live also. Amen? Amen. Fifty days after the first fruits, I could teach on that. You, you South Dakota folks, just hang in there with me because we're going we're gonna to deal with this Passover in April. Fifty days after that resurrection power. All Moses did, he, by the way, let me go back to that first fruit. One other thing about that Red Sea. When Moses stuck that rod over that sea, God parted that Red Sea. And let me tell you what he did. I love this tonight. Oh my goodness. He just didn't deliver Israel. You know what he did? He crushed Pharaoh's power over Israel. Amen. Pharaoh never again messed with Israel because he and his army were destroyed. Let me tell you this. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us about a sinless salvation. And in other words, we're not sinlessly perfect, but I will tell you this. When you come to Christ in true faith and you're buried and you're crucified with Him and you're resurrected with Him, sin will not have dominion over you and me any longer. Because he destroyed the power of sin at the cross. He destroyed the power of the devil at the cross. He destroyed the power of the flesh at the cross. He destroyed the power of the world at the cross. And Israel came out a free nation. Amen. They no longer had to look behind them for Pharaoh. Now they had their problems out in that wilderness. But it wasn't Pharaoh no more. I'll tell you that. It was other things that was wrong with Israel. I told Sheila today, and I might as well go ahead and throw a little bomb tonight. Most of this crap that's go out there, people are claiming it's spiritual warfare over folks. It ain't nothing but the fact they've never been crucified, buried, and resurrected with Christ and never met Him in resurrection power at the cross because I got their faith in all this stupid, scheming nonsense. And I'll amen myself tonight. Amen. Now, how do we walk in this resurrection power? Well, Christ didn't leave us powerless. Christ didn't leave us helpless. Christ didn't leave us without a helper, did he? Because 50 days later, what happened on the day of Pentecost? That is the outpouring. That is the outpouring. That is the outpouring. That is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you know what that represents to at Pentecost? It represents the giving of the law at Sinai. The coming of the Holy Spirit to the incoming dwelling believers. That if we will walk in the fullness of the Spirit, if we will walk in the fullness of Pentecost, we will fulfill the law. Amen. Isn't that beautiful tonight? Amen. By the way, let me give you a little another Bible nugget. I just, I just feel the holy ghost, jolly juice river a flowing here in Waveland. Where's that Mississippi River at from here? How far is that from here? <laughs> I feel something bigger than the Mississippi River flowing in me tonight. Let me tell you something, neighbor. There ain't no thou shalt nots in the new covenant. I, I, I just I challenge you. Go find a thou shalt not. The new covenant is this. You put off the old man. You put on Christ. You know what the law is under the new covenant? Someone will take a guess at that tonight. It's a four-letter word. The law of the new covenant is love. Because through the power of the Holy Spirit... You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love each other as yourself. That's the new covenant command to the believer tonight. And let me tell you something. All sin that believers get into, folks, all sin that believers fall into is a, is a result of them losing their love and their love waning cold and waxing cold to God. You know why divorce happens in marriages tonight? You can blame everything you want to on failed marriages. Let me tell you something. When you get down to it, it's just because two people fell out of love with each other and they did things they shouldn't have done. And that's exactly why people fall out of love with God. Things come in. They tempt them. And what does the devil do? He draws people away from the simple love of Jesus. Why do you think Paul told those Corinthians? He said the, the serpent beguiled Eve. And he says, I'm afraid that he's beguiling you to take you away from what? The simplicity. The simplicity of Christ. The simplicity of Christ. What's the simplicity of Christ? That's Him and Him crucified tonight. That is Him and Him crucified tonight. That's a simple message. 
We've complicated it. All of these principles of the gospel are found in these feasts. These were prophetic foreshadowings of Christ and the believer when God set this calendar up. Remember this tonight about these feasts. This was God's prophetic calendar. And it's beautiful. The cross, the burial, the resurrection, and the Holy Spirit. That's the foundation of our faith. Amen. Isn't it? Yes. There's, there's no other faith out there. No other faith believes in this right here tonight. You realize that tonight? Yeah. When I hear people claim that you know, Christianity is a religion. No, Christianity ain't a religion. There's a bunch of religions out there. It's a relationship, it's a relationship Andrew. And that relationship is based on what? It ain't based on the law. Because, see, the Pentecost, the, let, me, let me come over here. Let me come this other way so I don't break my neck. But I want to show you something here. I want to show you, want to show you something over here, folks. This right here, this right here, Pentecost, speaks of the law, of the giving of the law. Let me, let me give you a little Bible nugget here tonight, folks. The reason that God gave the law is because Israel wanted it. God didn't want Israel to serve him legalistically. And he don't want his people serving him legalistically tonight either. Amen. There ain't but one law that's in the heart of God tonight, in the heart of man tonight, and that's the law of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not doing things out of love, I don't care. You know, I've told people about giving. If you're not giving out of a loving and willful and cheerful heart, keep your money. Keep it. It ain't going to do you a thing. It ain't going to bring one blessing. I don't care how many schemes you're trying to to give, keep your money. If you're not doing it just because you love God and you love people, keep your money. If you're not serving God tonight out of love, it's best you just... Have you ever seen some miserably saved Christians? Amen. Do you know why they're miserably saved tonight? i tell you why they're miserably saved. Because they're living... They're not living in the Holy Spirit. They're living at Sinai. And that was the message of Pentecost. That the power to live right... And the power to live in love and the power now that comes in our hearts. What does Romans 5 and 1 tell us tonight? That the love of God, or Romans 5 and 8, that the love of God has been what? It has been shed abroad in our hearts by what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost. That came on the day of Pentecost. Amen. That came on the day of Pentecost. Glory to God tonight. That's what these feasts represent. Now, I've spent my whole while talking about these spring feasts. I didn't even get to this. <laughs> Could y'all give you 15 more minutes? And since the power went out, and since the internet went out, I get 10 extra 15 more minutes. I'm going to hit you real quick, just like this. Be with me tomorrow morning. We may even pick some of this up in the morning. This prophetic feast weekend. So we may deal with the land, but we're going to deal with this. So this is good stuff. The Holy Spirit is the ministry of the believer to the believer is to reveal Christ. And you should write this down tonight and write this down in your notes and take your notes out there again. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is three things. Number one, his number one job is conviction. His number one job is to convict of sin. He convicts the world of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. Of sin because the world does not believe on them. Speaking of Christ, we were going to do a message a few Sunday nights ago about the Holy Spirit, and we were going to entitle it, The Spirit Will Testify of Me. The Spirit's number one job is to testify of Christ, and the way He does that to the world is He convicts of sin. If you're a child of God tonight and you're not feeling conviction, you're not saved. That's right. If you Amen. claim you're a child of God, I want to change that statement. If you are a child of God, that you say you're born again, but you have no conviction of sin, you're not saved. Yeah. Number two, his ministry is to take the things of Christ and reveal them to the believer. That's what Jesus said. He said, he will take of me and he will come and bring them to you. That was the difference. Let me tell you what the law did. Let me give you the difference in the law 
at Sinai and the spirit of Pentecost. The law revealed things too, didn't it? What did the law reveal? Sin. Say it again, Chip. Sin. It revealed sin, didn't it? Yeah. It revealed the fact that a sinful man could would always fall short of a holy God, didn't it? That's right. You know why people are miserably saved tonight? I want to say it again tonight. They're not living at Pentecost. They're living at Sinai. Yeah. Because, see, you will always come up short living at Sinai. And there ain't a one of us tonight, and there ain't a one of you listening to me by internet television tonight on this conference that can live up to the guidelines of Sinai. And if you don't believe me, ask the nation of Israel. They ask for it. And they got That's it. what Christians want. Is that is it fair to say tonight that Christians want a, 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 a law book of do's and don'ts? Is yes. that fair? That, yes. that is, yes. I mean, when you get down to what most Christians want in their Christian experience, they want God to, to come down and they want him to write, Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. That is what most Christians experience is relegated and relegated down to. That's bondage. And it is bondage. It doesn't mean the law is not holy. The law is very holy. That's God right. is very holy. Amen. God never even had an inkling of a thought that Israel would keep that law. I, 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 can't, I can't speak for God tonight, but I will tell you this. I have a feeling that God was probably almost heartbroken when he was given Moses his law because he knew this law would become bondage to that nation mm -hmm. and it's become bondage to many others. That's absolutely right. Because he knew, you know what God wanted in Israel? He said it over and over in the prophets. Folks, if you read those prophetic passages of him reaching his hands out to Israel, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting Isaiah. In the very first chapter, in the very first chapter, he wanted Israel to obey. He wanted her to come to him and reason with him. What did he want to reason with God about? He said, just come to me and tell me that your sins are, you can't save yourself. Come to me and express to me that your righteousness is as a filthy rags. That's right. Tomorrow night we're going to hopefully get to that part of that because when Israel admits that, Israel's going to be saved. Amen. That's why she's not saved tonight. I know some of you are saying, well, I thought we tuned in to listen to a prophecy conference. Honey, there is so much prophecy in this, you can't shake a stick at it. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you know why there's prophecy in this tonight? Because these are part of the first coming of Jesus. Amen. And if you don't understand the first coming of Jesus, you sure ain't going to understand the, the second, second coming. coming. That's right. Amen. I'm about to wrap this up. No, we're going to take part two. Huh? Number three. Yeah, the, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yes. the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is yes. take a Christ and reveal and to reveal Christ to the church. And number three, and it's a very important ministry. And I want you to listen carefully to this one because this is huge. The Holy Spirit does not originate truth, but his third job is to lead the church into all truth. I'm going to come back over here behind my desk. I'm not going to get to these fall feasts tonight. i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have a little change of schedule tomorrow. We'll talk about the land tomorrow afternoon because the land and anti-Semitism work hand in hand. So we'll do the land study and a little bit of that tomorrow afternoon. I don't think you're going to mind this. This is sort of a prophetic weekend, and I just feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to go over these tonight. It's been good stuff. It's been good stuff. I, I'm just, it's been good stuff tonight. Um... Let me tell you this, folks. If you've been with me any length of time on this network, you have heard me preach this. You have heard me scream this. You have heard me jump up and down in cities and scream this. You have heard me write about this. You have heard me cry about this. You have heard me repeat this 10 million times. This book right here, you see this book right here, this precious book called the Bible? The Holy Spirit and the Word of God agree. The Holy Spirit has already written every truth to you and me tonight 
that we need for godliness and godly living in this precious book called the Bible right here. Amen. There's no additional manifests needed. There's no different additional books needed. Right. There are no additional works needed. There, this, this fallacious idea that there are 777 missing books into the Vatican, they're not needed tonight. I don't care if people found the 777 books. We don't even read the 66 That's books right. we got. Amen. We're so worried about all these missing books, we can't even get people to read the 66 they've got and live like they understand and know these books. That's right. Amen. You know why? Because they're living at Sinai and they're not living on the day of Pentecost. They're not living at Pentecost. Because the Spirit of God that's in you and me tonight, folks, He has come to lead us into all truth. Now what that means is this. And I've heard people use this verse in John that says, you, or Paul, he says, you have no need of teachers. You definitely have a need of teachers. What Paul was saying is this. When you hear something that people are claiming is from this book, and follow me here, and what is they're saying does not line up with this book. Let me tell you what's going to happen to me and you that are walking in Pentecost and not at Sinai. The Holy Spirit's going to go off like a bomb. And He is going to say to you, that's not truth. That's right. Correct. Amen. And He will point you back to this book. Let me tell you what He will not do. He will not point you and me back to experiences. How many of you have heard in the last five years, especially, it's, it's really happened a lot in the last five to ten years. How many of you ever heard this statement, we don't need the Bible, we just need the Holy Spirit? I have. It's all over the internet. I've had people literally tell me that. They said, your program is false because you tell people you need the Bible and you need to stop telling people that. You need to broaden their mind and tell people they need the Holy Spirit. We do need the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you something tonight on this, on this Purim weekend. On this Purim weekend. We ain't got to the Purim part yet. Let me tell you something on this Purim weekend, folks. The Holy Spirit is not going to do anything that's going to contradict right. this book. Amen. He's not going to say anything that contradicts this book. He ain't going to point you to anything that contradicts this book. He ain't going to point you to anything other than Christ. He ain't going to point you to anything, but that's going to encourage and edify and exhort in the mighty name of Jesus tonight. This book is pure. It is perfect. It is powerful. It will change lives. It will change homes. It will change destiny. Destinies. It will change the church. It will change me and you if we will but read it because the power behind the book, guess what the power behind the book is? It's the author of the book. And He points you to Christ. He points you to Christ. He points you to Christ. That is what Pentecost was about. He came to bring Christ to the church. Let me tell you this. The ministry of the Holy Spirit tonight is more vital to you than even if Christ was walking this earth tonight. That's why He told His disciples, He said, listen, it is expedient for me to go away. He said, if I don't go away, the Comforter cannot come. He can't come. Why was that important? Why did He say to those disciples, when I go away, greater works than these are you going to do? Why could He say that? I'll tell you why. When I go home this weekend and I go home next week, I'm going home to Tennessee. And Sheila is going to stay down here in Mississippi. Andrew's going to be in Louisiana. Others are going to be in other parts of the country. Listen to me tonight. Listen to this. This is beautiful. Guess what's going to happen when we leave each other? Sheila's going to take Jesus with her back to Mississippi. Andrew's going to take Jesus back to him in Louisiana. And I'm going to take Jesus back with me to Tennessee. You know how we're going to do that? Because He lives in all of us tonight. He's not just isolated to one location like He was. But the Holy Spirit in us is Christ in us. The hope of glory. Amen. That's why the church can do greater works. Because He's no longer confined to one place. He is God Almighty in us. With joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. I, we've gone a little over tonight, but that's all right. It's been worth it. It's been worth it. I want you to listen to me. We're going to pick this up in the morning. We're going to talk about the fall feast in the morning. I, I just I felt all week coming here that this was what the Lord wanted to talk about. And 
tomorrow afternoon we will deal with the other Israel issues about the land and anti-Semitism. Um, this represents the first coming of Jesus. All of these feasts in the spring represent His first coming. Everything He did in His first coming. Crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and 50 days. Pentecost means 50. And we are either living in the day of Pentecost, folks, or we're living at Sinai tonight. A little Bible nugget. 3,000 people died at Sinai that day. Remember what happened at Sinai? They built the golden calf. And, I mean, that's the other thing that just blows me away with Israel. I'm going to come around here and say this to you, because we're going to wrap it up here. You need to be with us and wait when the mark you can be with us. Come on down. See that time to come. When God gave Israel that law, you see, a sinful nation, a sinful man cannot keep the law of God. That's right. Let's just be blunt with each other and all of us here tonight tonight. Sinful men go pouring after other gods. That's right. Amen. A sinful man that does not love God will go pouring after mm -hmm. other gods. Right. Just like an unfaithful spouse will go pouring after other mm -hmm. lovers. Yes. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> God knew they were going to do it. Moses is up in that mountain. He's taken the law of God. He's got it on two tablets. He comes down. Joshua is with him. And Joshua is thinking, we're hearing all this wonderful sound down at the mountain. Moses, they're having a worship service down there. <laughs> and Lord Joseph, Joshua told him. He said, I think they're worshiping God down there. They're praising God down there. It's a sound of war. It's a sound of joy. And Moses said, no, Joshua, that's not the sound of war. He said, they've gone whoring after other gods. What did Moses do? Do you know how bad it got down there? And if you don't, I'm going to keep the five minutes. I'm about, I know we've been over a little bit tonight, but it's been worth it. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you how bad this was. They were literally telling that golden calf, when they made, here, made that golden calf, and some of the historians say they, they were making little gods along with the big calf. So they were making little gods as well, not just that big golden calf they were worshiping there. They were holding those little gods up. You know, they were saying, these gods brought us out of Egypt. Yeah. Oh my Do you not think that insulted God? Do you not think that is not insulted God? Yeah. He had struck down every firstborn baby of Egypt to bring Israel out of her bondage, but she gets at Sinai, and instead of praising God and worshiping Him while Moses was worshiping, by the way, they, while He was getting the law, they were down at that mountain grumbling and complaining that He was gone. They were finding things to grumble and complain about and run their mouth about and trash Moses and start slandering Moses and slandering the things of God. And they said, well, Moses has been lost up there and we can go do our own thing now because Moses is gone. He left us down here. So let's build a golden calf and worship a golden calf. And they held those gods up and they said, these gods be the gods that brought us out of Egypt. And Aaron was part of a rebellious leader was part of it. His own brother. Moses' his own brother. Moses comes down and he sees it. The anger of God raises up in Moses and he takes that tablet and he throws it down. And the Bible says the earth claimed from underneath the Israelites. And, and then he told Joshua, he said, Who is on the Lord's side? Tell those that, oh, those that are on the Lord's side, come to me. And those that are not, stay where they're at. And that day, Joshua and the sons of Levi took swords and went through the camp, and they slew nearly 3,000 idolaters. 3,000 died that day at Sinai. 3,000. You know what's so beautiful about God? You know why this feast is so precious? And the day of Pentecost. The horror of the law can save you. The law only kills the law only kills. That's all the law does. That's all the law can do. Mm -hmm. It condemns. Right. 
it condemns, it destroys, it weighs down because man can't keep it That's with right. a sinful heart. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, and the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and the power of the resurrected Christ comes in. Amen. And he gives us the power to keep the law of God and the law of love. Let me say this real quick. The law of love fulfills the law. If you love, your neighbor, you're not going to steal from you. That's right. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill him. If you truly love your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against him. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to covet what your neighbor has. You're going to be peace with what your neighbor's got. If you love God and you love your mother and father, you're going to honor your mother and father. That's right. You're going to do those things out of the willingness of your of heart that is filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. You won't have to tell somebody that loves God not to steal, kill, murder, destroy, Amen. 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 And if they do do it, they'll feel so horrible until they get it right. Conviction. The conviction will set Amen. in and they will find a place of repentance. And Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. <clears throat> Peter stands up on that day of Pentecost when the Holy mm. Spirit falls. Baptized. You know, even Pentecost is sad. Jesus told 500 disciples to wait for him in Jerusalem. I want 120 to listen to it. That's about the, that's about the number of that's about the percentage to know. About one in five. That truly listen to God and truly follow God to where he's supposed 100%. to be. Yeah. About, that's about it. Twenty percent. Get that. Anyway. The Holy Spirit fell. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Three thousand people got saved. Amen. Amen. The Spirit of God saved. The Spirit of God saves. The Spirit of God saves and delivers and sets free and does not condemn. There is there so now for there no condemnation to them that are in Christ who live not after the law Amen. and the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. 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 That's the power of these feasts. They're not tied to days. They were just prophetic shadows of what Christ did for us at the cross. Amen. These were what he did at his first coming. One quick thing. There's a gap. There's a gap. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow morning. There's a gap between Pentecost and Trumpets. We're living in the day of Pentecost, and we're waiting on the Feast of Trumpets. And we're going to talk about that Amen. tomorrow morning because that's harvest. Amen. That's the harvest. Amen. Did you get some out of this tonight? Yes. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's see. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness tonight. Lord, I know we went a little late. We glitched, but Lord, I just felt your freedom. Like I whew, felt freedom in here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful spirit in this place. Amen. And Father, I just feel a bubbling up of Holy Ghost power and just Holy Ghost outpouring revival here this weekend in Waveland, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray in from the north, the south, the east, and the west tonight mm -hmm. for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus tonight. I thank you for what these things represent. We're not tied to a day. It's about the man, Christ Jesus, Lord. You are our Passover. You are our unleavened bread. You are the first fruits. You are our Pentecost. You have sent the Holy Spirit to reveal you to us tonight. Lord, we worship you tonight who embody these feasts. Yes, and these are the feasts of prophecy. And Lord, help us teach this this weekend as you have us teach it in Jesus' name. All of God's people say amen. 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 Miles, prayers at gmail.com. If you need prayer tonight and you have any questions, I'll call forum at gmail.com. Folks, thank you all for helping us do this weekend giving. Uh, the moderator, they, they can put it out there. We will, uh, Matt Zell, Chris Matt, go forward gmail.com. Hey, God, let me slash the Matt Calls. Thank you all for being with us. Listen, there are some of you that are close enough to come be with us at the Lutheran Church of the Pines. It's on US 9 about 40 miles west of Biloxi. We just getting started tonight. It's going to be a humdinger.
sure of the day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a lot of teaching tomorrow, a lot of encouragement, a lot of faith, a lot of fellowship. Come and be with us. We know we've got other people coming tomorrow. We're going to have a grand old time down here in good old Mississippi. Don't ask me to spell it, but I can, can pronounce it. I can, thank you, correct? Did I say Mississippi right? Exactly. Two S's and two P's. I've got to say something funny. Somebody jokingly told me one day, they said they had asked the blonde, did she know about Mississippi? And I said, well, what was so bad about that? They said, well, I was a little worried when she asked me what was, whether it was the river or the state. So I'll just leave that alone. <laughs> that, joke will, that joke will go over your head. God bless you tonight. Have a good night, everybody. Amen. Be blessed out there. Sorry for the internet. But we'll see you in the morning. Amen. 10 o'clock. Good night. <laughs>